to the front of our, our church, we would have been allowed to make our payments before you. Oh. So, so much. Okay, let's get started. We've got Matt remotely. Uh, we know that for sure, but this is the county board meeting, uh, Tuesday, September 7th. Um, and we will be doing uh, interactive technology. The Pine County Commissioner, Matt Ludwig, will be attending the Pine County Board of Commissioners regular meeting today, September 7th. Uh, interactive technology pursuant to Minnesota statute 13D.02. Commissioner Ludwig will be seen and heard at the meeting via an electronic means and will participate from Staybridge Suites 2350 Commerce Drive Northwest, Rochester, Minnesota, a location that is open and accessible to the public. The public is invited to join the meeting uh, in person or remotely. So uh, hopefully, do we have anybody signed on remotely that we know of? We have a lot of county staff, um, and John Schumacher, and Gus is on as well. Okay, thank you. We will call the meeting to order and rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, public forum. Does anybody wish to speak at public forum? Got anybody, Ryan? I see. Okay. We'll move on to the adoption of the agenda. One ad that I'm going to add in is um, uh, the regular agenda. It'll be 1A, a uh, little remembrance time for Steve Chafee. Uh, what else? Mr. Chair? Yes. If we could uh, add consent agenda item number six, new hire for a child support officer. And if we could add under the regular agenda number eight, we have a special meeting next Tuesday, September 14th, planned for Namaji. And I'm wondering if we could have some discussion on the location and logistics of that meeting. Yes, we will. Any other additions, corrections? If not, we'll look for a motion. Awesome. I'll second it. Motion by Lovren, second by Moore. Uh, any discussion? If not, Debbie, you want to call the roll? District 4, Commissioner Waldham? Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig? You're muted, Matt. Hi, I was muted. Hi. District 1, Chair Holland? Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. District 3, Commissioner Lovgren. Aye. We'll look for approval of the minutes of the August 17th, 2021 County Board meeting and summary for publication. Minutes of the August 24th, 2021 special meeting, Committee of the Whole for budget purposes and the meeting of August 31st, special meeting, Committee of the Whole for budget. I'll make a motion to accept those. Second, second. Uh, motion by Lovegren, second by Waldham. Any discussion? Uh, Debbie, you want to call the roll? District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Holland. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Waldham? Yes. Thank you. We get uh, moving on to the minutes of board's report and correspondence, the Pine County Zoning Board minutes of May 27th and July 22nd of 2021, Department of Public Ser Service DPS driver's license exam stations, August 24th, 21, and land surveyor monthly report for August of 21. 
I'll move them. A second. Motion by Moore, second by Lovegren. Any discussion? Uh, Debbie? District one, Chair Holland. Yes. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Lovegren. Aye. District four, Commissioner Wall. Yes. District five, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. Thank you. We'll move on to the consent agenda, which you've had in front of you for some time. Ludwig will move. I'll second. Motion by Ludwig, seconded by Moore. Is there any discussion? If not, Debbie? District two, Commissioner Moore? Aye. District three, Commissioner Lovgren? Aye. District four, Commissioner Waldhelm? Yes. District five, Commissioner Ludwig? Aye. District one, Chair Holland? Yes. Thank you. Now we get to the fun part. The regular meeting and the uh, first item is the uh, recognition of the retirement of Health and Human Services uh, Office Manager Janet Schumacher. Uh, her more than 50 years of service to the county. Janet, it's unbelievable in my uh, book. We have people that have 50 careers and 20 years, it seems like, but. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we appreciate the steady hand that you've, you've given to Health and Human Services. I know in the years I've been here, you've had uh, a lot of changes. Um, you've moved about three times, I think, just, just since I've been on the board had a lot of directors and, and uh, work keeps getting turned out there. And, uh, and everybody says uh, the fine work that you've done. So Becky, do you have a couple words yeah. over it? Come up? Yes, please do, please do. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. So. I don't know that I have the right words or right amount of words just to express, express my deep appreciation and gratitude to Janet for all the work she's done over the last 50 years. Um, I don't think I'll ever be in front of you again um, or anybody will with an employee who's been here for over 50 years. It speaks to her commitment, dedication, loyalty, and just her excellent work. And Janet's been um, a model of excellence for all of us to follow as, as we work in health and human services. She is irreplaceable and I'm grateful um, for the years I've had with her. She's been a great help to me and has helped lead me in the way that I need to go. And I'm very appreciative. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I didn't know how I could follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with 50 years at Pine County Health and Human Services, I am moving on and passing on my duties to the next person. I may not be around to celebrate that retirement. However, I know in my heart that the staff at Health and Human Services will continue to be taken care of in their day-to-day -day work. I have been blessed with this career and owe a thank you to the commissioners, Pine County Administration, Health and Human Services Management, and all staff past and present. Thank you to the nine directors of whom I have worked closely with, as well as several supervisors. I owe a huge thanks to the last director of my career, Becky Foss. During her years as during her seven years as Health and Human Services Director. We have worked closely day to day, and I have thoroughly appreciated all of her support and rewarding expressions of thanks for a job well done. You'd almost think that we touched base writing her. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I look forward to seeing you all as we go about our daily lives. Mine much different. Take care and remember to make each day a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you got to come back up. <laughs> got to get your gold watch. <laughs> but thank you again. I didn't think Becky said something about uh, uh, during her little talk about being a model. And I and I am happy now for the young people to come into my place and to do what I have done for all the students. So thank you so much to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Janet, I would like to add that um, being here for many, many years, you have blessed so many people in your position. You have kept them on task. Your organizational skills are phenomenal. Um, I have heard so many wondrous things about you for the 35 years that I have been here. So um, thank you for everything that you have done. Um, you, you are a role model, and I just really appreciate you. I just enjoyed every day that I did what I did for everyone. I enjoyed my position so much. Yeah. It was a good day to be a really good day. And it showed. Thank That's you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And and right now we're gonna we're gonna take a moment of a first a moment of silence in honor of Steve Chafee. Um, Steve was on this board for 12 years. Uh, his fingerprints are all over um, so much of what we take for granted right now uh, in our policy book for our workers, in our work with the Mille Lacs Band, um, with our uh, public health, the way we're set up. Uh, Steve and I, um, worked on that for a long, long time. And we didn't always dis we, we didn't always disagree, but we didn't always agree. Um, and, and had a lot of conversations about where we should go. Um, we went down some rabbit holes together and came out in the, in the end, I think with a really good product. So uh, let's take a moment of silence. I talked to Steve about less than two weeks ago, and uh, he was he was quite groggy when I first called him, and then he and he got back to his old Steve, cracked a couple of jokes, and and uh, told me he was going to win. He was he was had been talking to the doctors and his families, and uh, they thought maybe they could get a couple three years of quality life out of treatments he was going to take and uh, he didn't get two weeks so life is precious I, I never I'm sure he wouldn't he said I wasn't sick wasn't sick last week I felt sick thought I had a kidney stone or something so hug your loved ones when you get home I don't know if anybody else has any memories they want to share of Steve. Mr. Chair. Yes. I, I would like to say two words. Um, gentle leadership is how I would describe Mr. Chief. That is true. Steve, if yes. I could make a comment. So Steve Chafee was chair when I was hired. Uh, and so I really got to know Steve in a special way uh, because he onboarded me to Pine County. He set the tone and direction and it was so abundantly clear, especially in his committee work on personnel and human services that he cared about people and that he genuinely wanted people to be successful. And he somehow, and he kind of reminded me of my father actually, um, in that 
he somehow made me know that he had really high expectations for me and for staff, but that he was always going to be there to help us. And I just, I really appreciated that. Thanks, David. I'd like to add that um, I've heard that a lot about Steve, not just here, but out in his career as an electrician, that he always worked hard to help people to um, succeed and help them in any way that he could um, in the background or in the foreground. Um, but yeah, he, Steve was a good man. He will be missed. All right, Judge Martin, can you follow that? Yeah. <laughs> I, we are excited to have Judge Martin here, and, and I, I really am uh, grateful that you take time to come down and update the board on what's going on in the district court. So I know you've had a, um, I don't know if you'd call it a, a difficult year or a, <laughs> a certainly a different year. Uh, yeah, it's definitely been a different year. That's yeah. true. So. First of all, if I could just yep. a point of personal privilege, I just congratulations to you, lady. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I, it's hard to even imagine that place down there without you at the helm and getting those emails from you, updating me on what's going on in the legislature. And so, you're going to be missed. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me some time on your agenda today to update you about what's going on upstairs with the courts. Uh, I don't know if I've met Commissioner Waldem. Of course, I know Commissioner Lovegren from her different life, but I'm uh, Judge Krista Martin. I've been a judge in Pine County for 20 years as of this November. And uh, my colleagues upstairs are Judge Heather Wynn and Judge Pat Flanagan. We are part of the 10th Judicial District. So we have 45 judges in our district spread over eight counties. Um, our chief judge is Stoney Hillius, who lives actually here in Pine City. Uh, but is chambered in Kanabic County. So we're very excited to have the chief judge from the PIC. It's been a while since that's happened. Pine is one of four counties in what we call the PIC assignment area. That's Pine, Isanti, Chisago, and Kanabic. We're the four smallest counties in the district. Um, and so we kind of have to band together for resources because we often are competing against our big sisters down south, Anoka, Washington, Wright, and Sherburne. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the PIC, and when I say that, those are the four counties I'm referring to, and that's the assignment area that I'm talking about. Um, I am willing to talk about whatever interests you. I Please feel free to ask me questions. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, I Amy Willert is here. She's our court administrator. If I don't know the answer, she might. We can certainly find it for you. So I'm happy to use this time You know, however you want me to use it, whatever works for you. I do have some prepared comments, but... Um, but if you have any questions, please just interrupt me. I'd be happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Um, so we are currently operating upstairs under the directives of the Minnesota Judicial Council and some interim orders that come from the Chief Justice. The situation is fluid. Um, the council watches infection rates and then relies on CDC and Minnesota Department of Health direction when setting operational guidelines for the courts. So there are some decisions that have been left to the districts based on area infection rate uh, with the COVID. Currently in the 10th district, we are under a mask mandate. So you saw uh, Amy and I entered with our masks on. We are required to wear a mask in all public court areas. Um, in the courtrooms, the presiding judge can allow participants to remove their masks depending on the circumstances of the case. That's typically allowed for those who are speaking. I had an interesting hearing the other day with Mr. Fredrickson's staff. There were three uh, county attorneys. We had a big calendar. And it was kind of like, I always knew who the lawyer was by the one that, oh, that was on that case, by the one that wasn't wearing the mask. So it's like musical masks on and off, on and off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are doing some in-person hearings and trials. Uh, what we are allowed to do right now in person are criminal jury trials. I will tell you there was a pretty big span of time when we were not allowed to do criminal jury trials and that really put us uh, behind in our uh, criminal clearance rates. I think maybe you know, Mr. Fredrickson has probably updated you on that. Civil jury trials, uh, court trials in criminal, juvenile delinquency, juvenile protection cases. We can do criminal settlement conferences in person and we have been holding those in person and I think that's been um, pretty helpful. We can do grand jury proceedings in person, 
criminal contested hearings. Uh, so if there's a challenge to the evidence on constitutional grounds and we're going to hold an omnibus hearing to hear that evidence, we can do that in person. And then we do some felony sentencing. Those are typically the ones where the defendant is facing a potential for a prison sentence. And so we do need them in our in our grasp, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, we need them in our courtroom so that if they are committed to the commissioner, they then have to immediately go uh, into custody. So for those that are out on bail, come in for sentencing, we do those in person. Um, we do have new technology in the courtrooms. I'm not sure if you've been apprised of that. I think it was purchased with CARES Act money. Is that right? Uh, right. So um, that was quite an undertaking. I cannot even tell you what that looked like up there when they were putting that stuff in. I mean, cords and buttons and gadgets and machines, and it was insane, but it's all now installed and I think working fairly well. We certainly have had a few ups and downs, but it's mostly working pretty well. What that technology allows us to do among a myriad of things, including document um, display and uh, lots of other things for the lawyers. We also can use it to have a hybrid calendars through Zoom. So we always have a Zoom session going when we're in the courtroom, even if we're in person and we're connected to Zoom, just like we can see um, Commissioner Ludwig here. And so we can see people who are appearing remotely um, and then we also have people who are in the courtroom. We most often use that for a hybrid calendar when we have some cases that we have remote hearings on and some where we need in person. I've got a calendar like this, that this afternoon. I have a sentencing in person and then I have a bunch of remote stuff. So we'll be in the courtroom and we'll be accessing that technology. The lawyers don't love it. Um, it's a little bit tricky in the courtroom. They'd rather be either remote or in person because it can be a little tricky, but we're all just you know kind of working through it right now. Uh, I can see a lot of potential for it going forward, uh, particularly in cases where we have civil commitment hearings um, or a case where we have an expert that's testifying like in a family court case if we're doing those in person and then they don't have to pay to have the expert come and they could testify by Zoom. So I think there's a lot of applications. We're just still working on how that's all going to shake out. Um, right now we're <laughs> just trying to get our work done like you, right? It feels like we're just kind of dog paddling all the time, <laughs> keep our head above water. Um, so the presiding judge is allowed by rule to limit the number of people that are in the courtroom. And if any of you saw, you know, kind of the high profile trial that went on down in Hennepin County, you know that that was a concern that they had there. And so um, we can, we do have the ability to set up a courtroom with Zoom so that we can let the media and overflow participants go into a courtroom, still maintain some social distancing and be able to observe um, the in real time, you know, live the proceedings, but not be actually in the courtroom with us. So um, any questions about that, what we're doing in person or how that's working? It's pretty limited. So we aren't using a lot of bailiffing time. Yes, Commissioner uh, Allen. Yes, uh, Judge, uh, the, the remote hearings that some of us thought could have taken place electronically for a while. Do you see them going forward like like the people we see come in here from uh, the facility in Moorhead or Fargo, wherever it is. Sure, I think that, yeah, that is definitely, um, so I served for, uh, you know, I was on the Judicial Council for yeah. six years. My term ended June of last year, 2020. So I got like the last three months of council was during the pandemic and it was hair raising. And then I, I chaired the other side work group, which was the work group that got the courts up and moving and running and set all the protocols for doing our hearings. And I did that through February of this year. So um, during that time that I was on that work group and chairing that, we did a lot of uh, surveys. Of, um, and we partnered with the Minnesota State Bar Association. We got surveys out to court staff, to judges, to lawyers, to litigants. We used our uh, litigant services folks to get us some litigant feedback on how remote court was working. And what we found is that there is an appetite for remote hearings. Um, certainly judges like sitting in their courtrooms, as you can imagine. So um, most judges are see the benefit to it, but do miss the, their courtrooms. Um, and some of the lawyers feel that way as well. But we do see a really strong appetite for continuing remote hearings. And I do think they will continue. I do. 
what that will look like is yet to be seen. But you know, the family lawyers love Zoom. The civil lawyers love Zoom. I mean, we, we always think about criminal when you think about the court. But we have, you know, lawyer. I had a I had a case where I had an attorney who was pro hoc vice, so he was appearing in Minnesota. He was licensed in Pennsylvania. Big case. It's been up to the court of appeals, Supreme Court, back down. Blah blah blah. Anyway, um, he could appear, you know, from his office in Pennsylvania and didn't have to get on an airplane and fly to Minnesota, which is how we used to do it, you know, and the lawyers would show up in the courtroom, even if they were coming from other places. So the civil lawyers, they don't have to leave their offices in Minneapolis. I actually, I just had a small hearing. One, my first hearing this morning was a default on a quiet title action. And I had a lawyer from St. Cloud and a, um, par a, a party from Alexandria, no, no from Albertville. And so, um, you know, they, it was a five minute hearing. There was no objection. It was a default. So something like that, you know, why wouldn't we give those folks an opportunity to do that by Zoom? We have used Zoom a lot. I mean, we have tried, I've tried family cases. I had a four day family case with three experts. We tried by Zoom. We've tried child protection cases. We've done contested omnibuses. I think we're going to start doing those that we are doing those in person, but I don't know. They went okay, right, Reese? I mean, it wasn't great, but um, so I think the officers like it, especially like on speeding tickets where they're not like, you know what I mean, they just right. pull over, they're in their car, they appear by Zoom, and then you get your, you know, 15 minute testimony or whatever, and they're back on the road. I mean, it's really, really useful in that way. What I think you're talking about is um, using it for not using the transport officers to bring, especially people who are high risk right. um, from prisons to court when they have pending matters in Pine County. And yes, <clears throat> the prisons have really upped their game uh, in doing remote hearings. And I think we are going to uh, definitely continue to do that, uh, to use Zoom for those unless, those cases, unless of course they're the defendant in a case that's going to trial, they'd have to be in the courtroom. Right. But otherwise, yes. I, we do have trouble once in a while where there's a security incident and the prison's in lockdown and then we can't get them. Or we've got, um, there's a COVID outbreak and everybody's in quarantine. So um, sometimes we have mix ups that way. Uh, it can be a scheduling nightmare, but no more so than trying to get a transport officer on the road. The other thing before COVID, you know, we started helping each other out in the pick by doing um, bail hearings remotely when they didn't have a judge in that county or we didn't have a judge here in Pine, if we were gone on vacation or at meetings or something. Then um, instead of, remember we used to load them in the car and ship them to Kanavik or drive them to Chisago. Now um, we started doing those by ITV. So that's, you know, that's Zoom light. So we definitely will continue to do those by Zoom. And I don't know, we haven't had this conversation. So um, I'm not sure what the county attorney's office or public defenders feel, but I could see an application. And I think there have been discussions about just continuing to do our bail hearings by Zoom because it limits the risk in the courtroom. It's really highly agitated people. People sometimes who are coming down off of drugs or who have, you know, not been taking their mental health medications and are really, you know, angry and upset. Um, then we have that jail staff there managing that and they're not in the courtrooms and we can mute them so we can continue to make a record. Like that. I don't mean that in a mean way, but you know, it's so hard to make a record when somebody's really misbehaving and you can't get them under control and you're trying to go on with your hearing. Now we can just push mute. I have been flipped off. I will say <laughs> <laughs> if I, well, I say you're muted, Mr. Jones, and then they communicate with me anyway. <laughs> but at least it doesn't mess up our record, you know, we, we get that. So um, right now, most of our hearings are remote. We are getting a tremendous amount of work done through our remote hearings. We have um, one public service counter in each county that in the state that's open. We've had ours open for a long time, 8 a.m. to 4.30, Monday through Friday, fully staffed. Our self-help services continue to be conducted by appointment remotely or by telephone. So self-help litigants or uh, pro se litigants are still getting service. Our public access terminals are available here in the building during regular business hours. So things are getting back to normal. Um, any questions about that so far? Oh, I, I do. Um, okay. So we know that when we meet person to person, um, and I think we're both visual people, where you can read the body movements, you can read the uh, facial expressions in the eyes. How much of that do you feel that you're missing when they're not in the courtroom? Um, I think 
that is why we are doing contested hearings now more in the courtroom for like criminal cases. Um, because that is important. And I think sometimes you can lose a little bit. However, you'd be surprised the things you learn when you see people in their environment. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, how they conduct themselves, um, how they dress, uh, how they interact with their children. I mean, you know, if you had a chips case and you see a mom with her child, you know, sometimes that happens. And a lot of times, really, Commissioner Lovgren, um, what the work that judges do, I mean, certainly we are judging credibility, but we judge a whole lot of other things that don't have to do with credibility. Like, is this document in order? Um, does this evidence make sense? Does this, you know, this, does this receipt prove that the goods were provided? You know, a lot of it isn't about reading body language. A lot of it for us, you know, we're in a civil case, a family case, we're listening to experts you know, you listen to an expert talking about, uh, I did a parenting evaluation or I saw the parent in the home or, you know, do you really need those people in your courtroom? I mean, they're expert witnesses. Mm -hmm. Yes, if we're trying to decide, you know, what's true and what's not true, that's why I think the hardest cases that I feel like we do by Zoom, frankly, are harassment restraining orders and order for protections, because then it really is really hard to know who's, the other thing that's really hard to know on Zoom that really does bother me, and I've had a problem. I mean, I've actually had to call people on this. I don't know who's talking to them. So, you know, when they're in my courtroom, they're sitting in a witness stand and they're there and I know they're there and nobody's, you know, and sometimes I'll see someone in the back trying to signal, you know, and I always call them out on that or the bailiffs will if we see that happening. But when you're sitting in your living room and you're providing testimony under oath, we don't know who's feeding you information. And so um, that can be a little bit tricky. So I think we're trying to move those contested things back into our courtroom for that reason. And certainly we do have, we're doing our contested omnibuses now in the courtroom, our child protection cases, um, trying to get some of that work back, back into the courtroom. Yeah, that's a good question though. Because there are certainly limitations to Zoom. There's no doubt about that. Motion practices works really well. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, Judge, you had talked about for some applications, maybe remote hearings work well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if the courts have had discussion about who will be allowed to make those decisions going forward. Will you as a judge, yeah. will the pick counties, will the tenth judicial, or will it be a statewide decision-making process? That has been a source of much debate. And you can imagine 300 district court judges, uh, you know, having opinions about that, that <laughs> strong opinions about that. You can't tell me what to do in my courtroom. Um, I think what they're hoping to do is, uh, I saw the latest report from the work group is they're trying to come up with a chart that is presumptive and not presumptive. So these cases are presumptively remote case hearing types, I should say, these hearing types are presumptively in person and then leave it to the discretion of the judge uh, presiding judge or the assignment area um, or maybe even district to decide what are our resources, what's going to work with our calendar plan, and then perhaps, you know, be able to have some leeway there. Because there, I've had a cases that were presumptively, I had a harassment restraining order case with like six participants or, you know, parties. They were all neighbors. It was one of those deals. And it was presumptively remote. And I got an exemption so that I, from the chief judge, because I had to do that in person. I mean, I, how was I going to sort that out with all those people? And there, people are really hard to control on that Zoom screen too, you know, sometimes where when I mean, you got a bailiff standing there and, you know, you can kind of get people a little bit more to pay attention and to listen and to not talk out of turn. So, so I've seen, that's what I think is going to happen. We're going to see a presumptive remote, presumptive in person. I don't think we're going to have any mandates, but I don't know. That story hasn't been written yet, but that's kind of the direction I think they're heading. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you have feedback about that. Like as a, as a county, what you think should happen for your constituents or um, for funding. Maybe you don't want to pay bailiffs anymore to be upstairs, <laughs> but <laughs> we do miss them. I, I, my, my feeling is, is as long as you think everything is being done fairly, Mm -hmm. We we trust you. Oh, okay. And, and well, so, um, you know, I'm a big believer in in using the tele uh, two way system. If it works, it works. If yeah. there's reason for you to think you want to have the people in front of you, then I would respect that. 
entirely. We definitely have been able to leverage some of the remote, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, in fact, maybe I'll skip ahead to that um, now, because one of the things that we did, we have been working on for a long time is our unified calendar plan throughout those four counties of the pick. And that's been going on for a while, several years, we've been working on that, trying to be more efficient uh, in the, our use of resources um, and litigant resources, court resources, because, you know, in a small county, there are economies to scale. You guys know that too, right? Being in a small county as commissioners, and you see those big counties like Hennepin and Ramsey, and they've got all these resources, right? And there's just economies to scale. There's just no, you know, there's specialization, there's more services. There, it's just, so we're trying to kind of capture that a little bit and say, okay, there's these four small counties. What can we do to kind of leverage that economy of scale that we see with bigger counties kind of as a unified group? And so we started on this calendar plan. Well, when we started doing remote hearings, we realized that there was some leveraging that we could do with remote hearings. And one of the things that we are doing now is some specialization. So uh, we have Judge Wynn and Judge Brosnahan, Judge Brosnahan's in Isanti, they do all of our CHIPS cases now. So they're the CHIPS specialists. So they are doing all the child protection cases for all four counties, which for scheduling and for just, you know, kind of really um, seeping yourself in the rules and the law and not skipping around, you know, I don't, it's really a difficult calendar sometimes when you're doing an order for protection and then you've got a criminal bail hearing and then you've got, you know, a child protection, you've got to remember all the rules. And so they're really, um, they are our child protection specialists, Judge Flanagan and I then in Pine do the family and civil. So, which has kind of given us a focus. So now we can focus on family and civil. And then we also are taking family and civil from Isanti. So Judge Flanagan and I are family civil judges for Isanti County as well. We take a, on a rotation, we take some of those cases. We will not be able to do that if we can't continue to use Zoom. So we have tried to leverage it from that perspective to, um, and then our staff, we have remote staff. So we've got staff that come from other counties remotely. They help each other out. They answer phones for other counties. I mean, it's a big project. It's a big undertaking, but um, it really is a way to try to um, marshal our resources and to um, and to be um, to be more um, mindful of how we use our resources because they're dwindling, right? I mean, I'm not even talking about money. I'm just talking about personnel. You, you know, it's hard to find people, right? So you want to, and people are retiring. Our court reporters, like a third of them, is that right? Or two, a half of them are eligible for retirement in the next like four years. I mean, nobody's going, coming out of court reporting school. We're going to have to think outside the box on our record, you know, so there's lots of challenges ahead. Anyway, so Zoom has definitely given us some opportunities to be innovative. That's for sure. It's also... <laughs> It's also crazy, <laughs> but <laughs> all the stories. Uh, I'm gonna have to write a book. I, I mean, I just you just can't even imagine the stuff that people do. The cigarettes. <laughs> 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 you can't smoke. <laughs> you saw we see them. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually had a lawyer, a lawyer show up um, for my one of my Zoom sessions with a cat on his shoulders. Oh <laughs> I had a lawyer come to a bail hearing. Now, admittedly, he, you know, his client was arrested and, it, and he, it happened quickly. And so he was at the bail hearing and he was like in a tiki hut. <laughs> he had like a windbreaker jacket on. <laughs> in a tiki hut. I was like, oh man, this is crazy. This is crazy. Oh, it's just, the list goes on and on. I have a friend who, one of my friends, I have, I, have my, I have a couple of judge friends around the state that we text each other all the time, crazy Zoom stories. And what, one of my friends had a guy who was on his Zoom hearing and all of a sudden started running down the road because a dog was chasing him. <laughs> Zoom hearing, so. um, funny, funny things. So I'll update you a little bit on what Judge uh, Flanagan and Judge Wynn and I are up to outside of our court hearings. Um, Judge Wynn is and Judge Dowdle from Chisago are still running Veterans Court in Pine and Chisago counties as a sort of pilot program. Uh, she told me there was some recent legislation that might change some of their um, how they do their, their work, but they're going to get together and talk about that. I don't know the details of that. I'm sure Mr. Fredrickson will update you because he's very involved in that project as well. Um, but Judge Wynn wanted to assure you that nonetheless, the group is very committed to continuing to provide increased services and supervision for veterans. Judge Wynn also runs a truancy court where she kind of took the show on the road and went out into the schools uh, with her court reporter and her uh, court staff and they did truancy hearings in the schools. 
as kind of a wraparound project. Uh, that of course shut down with COVID, but the schools in Pine County are now requesting in-person truancy hearings again in the school. So she's going to request an exemption from the chief judge that still hasn't been resolved yet, but if that happens, she'll be back doing truancy court in the schools. I'm not sure how that will go. Uh, she co-chairs the 10th District Equal Justice Committee with, uh, with Juanita, Judge Juanita Freeman out of Washington County. A couple of young heavy hitter judges <laughs> taking on some really tough work, but they do a good job. And she also co-chairs the PIC uh, Children's Justice Initiative Committee, and she teaches child protection at New Judge Orientation twice a year. Uh, Judge Flanagan is on our 10th District Administration and Finance Committee, so he takes care of the money piece of our district and helps do that. And also um, he is the uh, chair of the Pine, I think, Security Committee, which has sort of disbanded right now because nobody's in the building. Well, you guys are here, but you know, we're not really as concerned upstairs about security as we used to be. I'm the chair of the PIC e e program, which is the Early Neutral Evaluation Program. We started some years ago. We've been able to continue that. It's for our families in divorce and custody cases, an opportunity for them to meet with evaluators to resolve their cases short of litigation. They've been doing that by Zoom. It's been very successful. And we are um, really happy that we've been able to help families continue to resolve their cases. Um, I'm one of the mentor judges for the new judge orientation program. So I spend a week every year at new judge training, talking to new judges, talking to new judges off the ledge. <laughs> it's really hard during COVID. There are judges, my, the last time I did the session, last October that had never been in a courtroom as a judge because they came on the benches in the era of COVID. So it's, it's a whole new experience for them. I also serve on the 10th District Pro Bono Committee. I think you saw that uh, Mike Bierke just won the Pro Bono Award this year, which was really exciting uh, from the 10th District. And then I'm the secretary and longtime member of the Law Library Committee with <laughs> Commissioner Moore and County Attorney Fredrickson. Oh, we have some good times, don't we? <laughs> uh, court administration has 11 staff. Uh, they are three full time in the building. The remaining eight are hybrid. Sometimes they're in the building, sometimes they work from home. Uh, Amy Willard is our court administrator. She took over from our long-term court administrator, Luann Blagan, who retired in December of 2019. Uh, and then Amy was the court administrator two months when COVID hit. <laughs> so it was a daunting task to start with. And then she had a baptism by fire, but she's doing a great job. And not just saying that because she's here, she's doing a really, really great job. And we are so very fortunate to have her upstairs with us. The training room up there is complete. You know, they removed all, we don't do have paper files anymore. So all that's paper files and the rolly files are all gone. And now that's going to be a training room. Our case statistics are going up. They're on the rise. Uh, we have 150 more uh, civil cases this year than we did last year at this time. Um, family cases are the same, exactly the same, actually. Our probate cases are up slightly. Our criminal cases um, in 2020, I'm gonna tell you the number, in 2020, we had 2,613 criminal cases filed at this time. This year, we've got 2,966, so we're up by 350. So we got a lot of work to do there, Reese. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do want to tell you that I feel like, and I think Amy would support me in this, and, and Reese, Pine County, we really got on this fast. I mean, we were some of, we were trailblazers with Zoom and remote hearings. Um, I think the judges were, you know, work really well, I feel, with our justice partners. We had meetings. I mean, we really have been able to keep our head above water. Some places have sunk, you know, really. So um, I'm very proud of, of what we've done in Pine County. Um, since the pandemic began, so the, the judicial branch kind of governs everything by clearance rate. So if 100 cases come in in a month, you should send 100 cases out the door, right? You should resolve 100. And then during pandemic, of course, we shut the courts down all but emergency cases. So we had clearance rates of like 32%. You know, I mean, we weren't able to clear cases. Since the pandemic began, we have a 93% clearance rate for all case types, which I think is phenomenal since it began. And an 86% clearance rate for major criminal. I have seen some recent numbers. Uh, Reese, I wasn't able to get my hands on them because I think I saw them kind of clandestinely perhaps. <laughs> but they're gonna come out later once they're firmed up. But I saw some numbers of Pine at 114%. So, I mean, we are really working hard. We are getting a lot of work done. Now that we can try cases again, we aren't trying that many cases, but 
at least the defendants know that we're ready to try the case. So that settles cases. You can't settle criminal cases if you can't tell somebody, we're gonna give you a jury trial if it isn't resolved. So um, that has really helped. Uh, since September of 2020, our clearance rate in Pine County is 97.8%. So um, we, still have, we still have a little ways to go to get to 100, but I definitely feel like we're gonna get there. So I'm, I mean, the backlog was scary and it's still out there, but we are definitely, I mean, everything that was on the backlog list has been put on for hearing and most of it resolved. Um, so I feel like we're doing, I think we're doing a really good job. And I, I really just want to say kudos to our justice partners, the county attorney's office, the public defenders, our probation and DOC agents, your, the jail staff. Oh, we have such great jail staff here in Pine County. Oh, they're so great. I can't even tell you how great that holding cell works. It's amazing, literally amazing. Um, so I, they have really been team players. And you know what? I, I think to be a team player, you have to voice your concerns as well. Um, and I, Michelle Skubitz in the county attorney's office has been such a great leader and, and, and sometimes the person who stands back and says, I wanna play devil's advocate, let's talk about this, or this is gonna be an issue for us. And it's just been so great to have that feedback and be able to come up with a plan that kind of encompasses everybody. And no, we can't meet everybody's needs or desires, but at least you know, kind of get everybody on board. The PDs are great, our public defenders are wonderful. You know, They battle it out in the courtroom, but when they need to make policy decisions or to protocol moving forward, I feel like that those two offices work tremendously well together. I mean, credit to you, Mr. Fredrickson, and to Chris Anderson and the PDs. It's, and Michelle, who's you know wonderful. Um, so I think that um, we're doing pretty well. I guess I would say it's been, I've been on the bench 20 years. <laughs> Is not the same job. <laughs> Some of the same people. <laughs> Some of the same people. I actually told a defendant the other day, we got to stop meeting like this because you know, people are going to start to talk. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so um, anyway, if you have any questions, or I don't know if Amy wanted to supplement with anything. Yeah. <laughs> Amy is a uh, power district and she works really well I mean they we have great I, I really do feel very lucky I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure if I feel like Janet like every day is every day at work I'm not gonna say that <laughs> <laughs> for a lot of stressful days but I feel like we're doing pretty well and uh, it was good we're doing pretty well so, so I yeah. have a question Mr. Chair yeah. so I heard uh, Judge Martin, I've heard you talk about how technology, we were trailblazers in the county. And I think we feel the same way as the board. But I wanna know how that technology has helped you in the middle of the night search warrant phone calls that we used to always have. <laughs> well, you know, actually, I mean, <laughs> so right before the pandemic started, um, so it, the way it used to work, just so for those of you who don't know, and of course, Commissioner Ludwig used to be a, deputy and investigator, if they needed a search warrant in the middle of the night, they'd literally call the judge and which was me because I was the only judge in Pine County and now there's three of us. I mean, I was the only judge that lived in Pine County. So I was the closest to get to get to because they came to our house. So then you'd get a call in the middle of the night and it'd be like, yeah, this is investigator Ludwig and we got a case, we need a search warrant. And then I'd have to like crawl out of bed at 2.30 <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know it too, Commissioner. <laughs> I have so many stories about bad nights. <laughs> I actually came in here once uh, because I had my sister staying with me with her kids and I didn't want them to get woken up. So I came, in, I used to come into the building. I'd just drive down here to the courthouse. I was sitting in the sheriff's office. It was like two, maybe four o'clock in the morning. It was a terrible case. And there were lots of officers were out. And I was sitting down um, stairs and one of an officer came in and looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I go, oh, I'm here to, because um, they want to search a house. Knavik wants to search a house and I'm waiting for them. Is it your house? <laughs> <laughs> Got a mirror. <laughs> 
probably didn't recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the real me. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm Judge Martin. Well, of course he felt bad, but I mean, how could the guy, I mean, I looked terrible. So I got a lot of stories about that. But the way it works now is um, we do them all through the, uh, the Minnesota BCA has a website. It's the same place we do our e-charging. Everything's electronic. So now we actually have a rotation. Again, that those pick judges, there's nine of us in that assignment area. We take a week. So one week you're on call. The, it works great, uh, invest, or Investigator Ludwig, Commissioner Ludwig, <laughs> because what happens is when the officer needs a search warrant in the middle of the night, because now with DWIs, you know, thank you, Missouri versus McNeely, nothing good comes out of Missouri. But and now, of course, we get calls on those DWIs too, but that they need a blood draw on. So we get a call and um, they have one number. All the officers in all four counties call one number. It's automatically forwarded to us. Then we answer it and then we tell them who we are. And then they just submit the search warrant to us through the e service or the e search warrant program. We have our laptops with us. I sleep with my laptop when I'm on call. Just open it up and um, log in and sign the warrant. It gets a little tricky if you're going to reject it. And I did that one night. Um, I, well, I mean, I've done that more than once, but I rejected it. They came back with more information. I rejected it again. Finally, I was like, should I just sign it? I mean, I'm so tired of being woke up. But, <laughs> <laughs> but because it was better. The one thing that was better was when the officers were sitting in your kitchen and you're like, I need more information. They could get the information for you. And then they we just write it in and, you know, but now it's got to go back and forth and back and forth. So it's a much better system though, Investigator Ludwig, much better system. Done. So, yep. <laughs> no more. But those it was uh, Weedenstrom who had that dog. Remember the dog? What was that dog saying? Rowdy or Russell? I don't remember. He barked all the time. So he would pull into my driveway. I had a two dogs. They'd start barking. <laughs> Everybody's barking. Uh, those were fun friends. Okay, I digress. <laughs> Anything else? Public defenders. You mentioned uh, the work they do, yep. and we. For a while, I know I was reading, having trouble getting enough public defenders. It's still an issue. <clears throat> well, I think the difficulty is that's a pretty high burnout job. Right. And I think also it's also it's the same thing. I mean, I think uh, Reese has had a pretty steady crew for a while, but you know, they're young lawyers. They come in, they work them to death, and then they want to move on and make more money, either in private practice or they or they go off to the bigger offices in the metro where they can make more money and. Um, so live closer to where they want to be. So I think that's our problem with, but we have a really, we have a pretty solid crew right now. Um, and they're experienced. We have a really experienced group of public defenders, which is great. One of our more experienced public defenders is, uh, is leaving to go to the uh, state um, appellate office. So he's going to write briefs and argue cases at the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court with good reason, because he's a great writer and a smart guy, but we're going to miss him. But otherwise, I think we've had a pretty we've had a pretty stable group, and in your office too, Reese, pretty stable group. We probably can't hold on to them forever, but yeah, I mean, it is you know it's difficult. It's a hard job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like hey. officers, right? Don't you guys have trouble with that too? They come here, they get trained, and then they go down to the Twin Cities. Now we're the place to come to, though. Yeah, now we're the place. <laughs> you don't to want to be in the Twin Cities anymore. <laughs> Uh, well, if you ever want to attend a hearing, you're welcome to do that. We have Zoom. Everything is open through Zoom, so you can always Zoom in. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call. I see you out in the community all the time, and Commissioner Lovegren. So, I really, just feel free to call or um, ask us any questions. We'll try to keep you updated. I thought maybe in about six months I might come back. By then, we'll have more answers to what is going to be remote. Maybe going forward, what's going to and how our numbers are looking. I'm, I'm, I think our numbers are going to be looking really good. And I tell you why, because we're working hard, Yeah. right? You know what? I mean, I know in the cities, they'll be like, well, you know, you don't have as heavy a caseloads. Well, you know what? We had 50 cases on a morning calendar, 50 that the lawyers and I handled, and not just me, I mean, all the judges, but I'm saying that yeah, we're not sloughing. I can tell you that for sure. So, <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks. Much. It was nice seeing all of you. I'm going to go to the customers now. All right. <laughs> Health Insurance Committee report. Thank you, Matt, or do you want me to go? Yeah, that would be great because I'm really noisy here. And so I'm going to, if I add something, I got to unmute.
Okay, will you add if you feel that you want to add, okay? I can see his lips moving, but I can't hear him. So um, it was a good meeting. I, we're on track. We had a couple months where we had over usage um, than what we had planned on having. Um, but everything else, it, it looks good. Um, they're talking about a 6% increase if we stay with United Healthcare. There's a couple different things that um, where we're determining the usage and Justin's going to see if he can do some negotiating with them to get some numbers lowered so that we can still be putting money in our pot. Um, what's the best way to describe that, David? <laughs> well, I think the Justin believes that we have had some increases proposed that are not supported by the usage Thanks. or your microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Justin believes we have we are we have a proposal that has some increases that is not supported by the usage we've had, uh, and they're also trying to um, increase the administrative expenses beyond which we think are reasonable. So um, Justin is very hopeful that he'll be able to negotiate uh, some better rates uh, with UHC, uh, and then our rate setting. Uh, went into some detail as to why 6% seems to make sense. And I think everyone on the committee agreed that that seemed like a reasonable uh, increase for 2022, although it does have the potential for, uh, depending on where claims land, to increase the exposure for the county. Uh, and then at that point, we would need to tap into the reserves that we would come out of 2021 with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was better than I expected it to be. Is the administration of the whole system working with our audit department, UHC? I think Kelly and the UHC are working really closely together, are you not? Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it actually works pretty slow. Each week I get the invoice email directly to me and it's directly withdrawn from our bank. Um, and so it's been like clockwork and it's easy. Good. We'll take easy. Anything else on that? If not, we'll move to the facilities committee. JJ, you want to take that one? Oh, uh, yeah, I can. Um, well, what are we going to do here? Uh, we we'll skip right down to the furniture installation is complete. Um, right here for the courthouse remodel and the transition. Furniture walls divide off the cafe area and work area have been ordered, though. Um, Pete is getting a mechanical bid for a conference room. HHS staff can begin moving and we'll coordinate with IT to schedule where the computer moves. HHS front desk at the South Pine Government Center was shut down on Friday, the 1st of October, and opened Monday the 4th. So there'll be a little downtime there. There's some copiers to be moved from South Pine Government Center to the courthouse. Uh, Ryan's going to follow up with the City of Pine City to make the final coordination for the door access card readers. County will move its Wi-Fi points and security cameras to the courthouse. It should all take place by November 1st. Um, what else we talk about? Oh yeah, roof. Uh, estimated cost 100,000 for a roof at the uh, North Pine campus. Funds will come from bond proceeds. Also parking lot improvements at the cost of 125,000 at the North Pine uh, Government Center 1610 building. And that will also, uh, well, it will be from the bond proceeds and building fund. Um, for anyone that wanted to know the balance of the building fund as of December 31st, 2020, the balance is $313,943. Sounds like we're going forward with the building of, of uh, a North Pine Recycling Center up at the Willow River location. There was one bid, a grant rather, of 178,000 to construct a 40 by 60 at the North Pine transfer station. 
Now, since then, I did drive by there and look, there is natural gas right in the shoulder of the road. And I would anticipate it being an easy hookup to help for the heating of that. And then the sanitary sewer, I haven't heard back from the city of Sturgeon. They currently supply city sewer to the boys camp there. And I believe it comes in the north driveway. So there's a little bit of distance there, but I guess we just have to see what, what the cost would be for that versus the insulation of a septic system. Uh, other projects, Ryan had reported that uh, he's got the quote for the assisted listening devices for the community room at the North Pine Government Center. And Ryan's gonna check that quote over. And the next meeting for facilities will be October 6th. Thanks, JJ. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, we'll move on to ordinance 2021-43 amending the county land use. We had a public hearing on the 17th of August. Do you want to go on that, Caleb, or do you want me to comment on that? I'm, I'm happy to. Well, if you'd like to, you're sure welcome. Um, it was an interesting meeting. <laughs> um, but the one thing we had been talking about the point system that they had and their, their board was looking it over and um, they want mitigation points, correct? And they wanted to take that back. And so their committee um, still wants to do some more research on that. So we don't have that today, but we do have all the other things that was on that special meeting so that we can pass that and get those lakes in, in the um, area that we wanted them to be so that they can move on with their plans and um, everything else is the same as just the mitigation plans have been taken off for their review all. It was a good meeting. Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. So at the, when we had the hearing, I think the parts that are coming forward, I think we were in agreement on at the last meeting, weren't we not? Yeah. Yes. Ours, I understood. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a point system of how we we're going to get to a, right. a mitigation thing, and I've understood how they they withdrew that from the ordinance. Mm -hmm. the, have another hearing when it got to the when they ever got that figured out. Um, yeah. Jeremy did rewrite them. Um, they got together and they did a really. Um, I think it was a really good job on the changes that they made, um, but I was the committee still wants to see what they want to do from here. But yeah. So, are you making a motion? I'm making a motion to accept. I will move um, resolution two zero two one dash forty three. So. Ludwig makes a motion after ordinance 2021-43. Uh, does everybody understand what we're adopting here? Is there any discussion? If I hear none, Debbie, you want to call the roll? District 3, Commissioner Lovgren. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Waldam. Yes. District 5, Commissioner Ludwig. Aye. District 1, Chair Holland. Yes. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. Thank you. And then appointment of the Housing and Redevelopment Authority Commissioner. Now consider the appointment of Henry Fisher as a District 2 rep. Uh, uh, fill the remaining term, which expires October 4th, 2024. I'll make a motion to approve Henry Fisher uh, on resolution 2020-68. All second. A motion by Moore, seconded by Ludwig to approve Henry Fisher. Uh, Henry's been around for quite some time. I think most of us... Me and David had to do a little core twisting. Yeah. <laughs> he eventually gave me his, his, he didn't want to do it. And then 
we filled them in kind of what we're, our plans are and then he was good. Henry's a good guy. Yeah. Anyway, any, any discussion on that? If not, Debbie, you want to call the roll? Four, Commissioner Moldham? Yes. District five, Commissioner Ludwig? Aye. District one, Chair Holland? Yes. District two, Commissioner Moore? Aye. District three, Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, before we move on, just I have had conversation with um, two individuals so far for the replacement that's coming for Dennis Corky. Okay. But I have not had answers back yet. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to commissioner updates. Uh, Shaq. Um, there was a lot of talk about the new Delta that's coming and about having um, booster shots. And then we got an email after that that was asking for us to um, contact our representatives in support of Jan Malcolm because they're asking for the removal of her position. Um, I reached out to the senator that is actually proposing that, and he stated that the reason that he's doing it is because sometimes you have to push some buttons to get some discussion as to other options and what else is available. Um, it was a really good, um, it was just very informative what he came back with. And so um, that's kind of where things are at is they're trying to figure out where to go with everything that's happening with um, COVID and then with the Delta to figure out how, it's, how Minnesota can best um, survive. Snake River watershed. Uh, neither one of them we did have this. Okay. Uh, Regional Development Commission. That's the one where was it? Yep. Yeah, and I had I had yeah. left a voicemail for Bob. A boss, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if he has not gotten hold of you yet. No, he has not. No, okay. I just checked again. All right. Uh, NLX. And Alex, I got there a little bit late because we were in the insurance committee meeting, but um, one of the things that they were really hoping to do was to ride on the Amtrak tails and to get the money that they need to, to continue with NLX through the um, Amtrak. And that was, that's not going to happen. So um, the majority of the talk that they had when I was in there was that they need 80 million of non-federal money to get this going. Um, they're trying to figure out how they can get the money. And so they've decided that they're going to hit the Congress um, hard for the monies that they have so that they can see if they can get the money that they need to keep moving forward. One of the other issues that they have is the bridge that they're working on. Part of it is in um, Wisconsin and part of it's in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So they can't get that financing to go, you know, Minnesota financing is not gonna help Wisconsin side. And so, you know, how are they gonna do that? But um, yeah, that was there to stand still. Okay. Thanks. Uh, HRA. I'll take that, Mr. Chair. Yep, go ahead. So um, we had our meeting. Um, the, there was um, our administrator, David Minky, is going to be the acting executive director while we um, work through the or whatever role the HRA and to bring it to the county or however we decide to an EDA, however that gets formed and that's in the process. So Dave is gonna um, work with the, the board and see us through that process. Um, their uh, a firm was chosen to do the audit. Uh, they were, they have to go, they're missing one out of them. So there's two, I think there's two years to audit. That'll be taken care of. Um, probably the other, uh, uh, we talked about the appointments that are upcoming. And then I think they, they covered their inspection report, but I don't know, David, do you have anything that you wanna add on that transition from the HRA to an EDA or whatever that happens in that process? That's probably the most important thing that came out of that, I think. Thanks, Matt. And so the HRA board did uh, get updated on the study committee a concept that the county is moving towards and there was some interest among the membership to participate in that. Uh, and so that seemed positive. And then the board is going to start meeting at the North Pine Government Center 
uh, just to better it has better supported technology and a little more space um, for social distancing. Thank you. Central Minnesota Council on Aging. Um, food support uh, continues to be an item for elderly. Uh, and in our particular area, there was a mix up with a grant that Family Pathways uh, was to get and they provide a lot of chore service uh, for people in Pine, Kanabic and Isani counties. So they're working with them to try to get that resolved because it's hard to get those people anyway, the, the worker bees that do the chore service. And uh, we, it, it would be, it would impact people in Pine County if we can't get that figured out. So I'm sure they will. Um, under other, I just saw David had a thing about the um, Pine Tech numbers. I think there's 27. Do you want to... and Terry, I wonder, Terry, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. You printed it for me. No. <laughs> so, um, were you talking about the other? The, the, how many students okay. were taken advantage of the? So in the cohort program, we have 27 participants. There's two in automotive, four in business administration, four in cybersecurity, four in early childhood development, two human eligibility service workers, which is awesome, eight nursing, and two for welding. And it was not public, publicly introduced until July of 2021. So those are pretty late, late, late July. Oh, late, late, late. <laughs> and so this is the Pine County College Initiative where we're using the um, American Rescue Plan funds to support students to enroll in Pine Technical and Community College. And so I, I think that to have 27 students enroll so quickly uh, is remarkable. And when you look at that list of majors that those students will be working on, those are critical skills mm -hmm. in our regional economy. I'm glad they added all these other classes. You've got cybersecurity, um, human eligibility service worker, which is gonna benefit. Right. You know, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about what the business administration. Mm -hmm. And so there's also not listed in those numbers are non, I'll call them the non-regular, the work fast, what we used to call the work fast programs. So those are still available uh, for workers. Uh, and Joe just, uh, Joe Mulford, the president of the college didn't have the numbers for us. This time, but those are still available and they're promoting them. Well, I know that they're really, um, they're figuring that they're gonna have high attendance because they've contacted teachers. And I know they teach classes and then they're Sorry. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Awesome. So ter Terry is invited by AMC uh, to next week or two weeks. Next to, week. Next week. Yeah, yeah, to go to the uh, policy conference and be a part of a panel to talk about the American rescue plan uh, funds because AMC thinks that this program is uh, unique in the state and they're really interested in helping to get the word out. So I sat in on an AMC coffee one morning and they were talking about what are y'all doing with your ARPA funds? And it was really exciting to be able to say that we did this and to watch people's faces because it's, it's such an uncommon thing. Right. To, to be able to say to be the first county where anybody who graduates from school, you know, graduates go to college for free for two years. And um, it, it was just really, um, it's exciting to see the reactions that you get from that, but to know that we're really benefiting our county right. and the kids coming up. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Terry, for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, under other, other, <laughs> <laughs> next week we have a scheduled meeting that we were planning on meeting at uh, Namaji. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm just wondering if we shouldn't postpone that location, not the meeting, but the location until we figure out 
where these variants and everything is going on. Um, we, we know we have a safe meeting place either here or the North Main Government Center. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna slight Becky at all, but I think she will understand. Uh, we'll come there later, mm -hmm. but. Um, and just for a little background, Namaji has implemented a mask requirement for anyone entering their building. And so it just seems challenging to try to have a public meeting at a private employer who has a mask requirement um, knowing that we, and we don't have the technology to allow remote participation from that location, where if we did uh, move the location to the North Pine Government Center, uh, we could have uh, remote access as an option, as well as making sure we had enough space to keep people spread out. I think it's a good idea. I, I, um, I know Matt really wanted to attend that meeting at Namaji, and I think it would be easier for him if it was postponed till later too. And we'll, um, we'll do the meeting. We just right, but not at Nama he wanted to go to Namaji. <laughs> so yeah. I think we that all was want your, to go to Namaji. That was there. your um, pick, wasn't it, Namaji? Way back when? Yeah. Well, that I think Dave's right. It ha that really is an all-in-person type meeting. There's just not that tech. That's kind of out in the bush. <laughs> yep. Yep. And after being with Becky on broadband, we know that their internet service up there is not the best. <laughs> so let's plan on is. Is the North Bank Government Center open? Is that it okay? It is available. If okay. we meet there? Yeah. Okay. And that meeting will be then at 10 o'clock next Tuesday, September 14th at the North Pine Government Center. And we will have a video option for that. Perfect. And so Matt, will you, and you can let Becky know, you can let Debbie know um, <laughs> if you plan to join that uh, remotely or not. So we're going to change the the starting time from nine to ten, because I believe that the meeting was originally was scheduled for nine. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say ten? You did. Okay. Oh, I'm. I was wondering. Okay. I'm sorry. I nine. If I had been thinking, I would have said nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for. You got one that. mistake for the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nine o'clock at the North Pine Government Center for next Tuesday. Do we have any other business we need to take care of? Any other others? We've got a host of meetings coming up. No other business, we'll declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Oh. So we still have a couple minutes to talk about the opioid stuff. And do you want to stay for that? Yep, I got to see you, Matt. I'll be right back. Okay. Bye, Matt. Do you have a couple minutes, Reese? See you guys. Yeah. Okay.